Hi, welcome to a special edition of Education Matters, uh, Lessons Learned During the Pandemic. Uh, with me today is the superintendent from the Carlsbad East Rutherford Regional uh, Board of Education, uh, D Dr. Dario Swarza. Uh, welcome, Dario. How are you? Thank you, Ms. Penny. You're doing really well today. Thank you for having me on your show. Now, uh, the reason I invited you is you're one of the few districts that's doing five days. We are one of the um, smaller regional high school districts in the state of New Jersey, but we do um, accept students from three different communities, the communities of Carlset, East Rutherford, and recently we've acquired the community of Maywood. All three communities are located here in Bergen County. All right, so I, I, I talked about you currently being in a five-day. How did you start the school year and how did you look at when you're opening the school year over the summer? So over the summer, we were working with various different superintendents on uh, what the new year was going to look like. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a um, scheduling committee here in Bergen County, where we looked at different plans and then put together a, a scheduling committee report on reopening for the entire county. And some superintendents and districts accepted some versions of the report, some went their own way. But as we kind of uh, joked about earlier, nobody had the crystal ball to really see and find out what the school year was gonna look like. Uh, but we did have some data at the time and uh, we did uh, go through what really was kind of like a survival mode from March to June. So uh, me and my team, uh, we, we used the, the, the time from March to August to prepare for the new year. Uh, we didn't look at, at, as, at September opening as survival mode anymore. We looked at it as now we have to deliver. And uh, we knew that the, our students' uh, mental health and educational um, stability and needs uh, were extremely uh, deficient during March to June during that survival mode. And we knew we were gonna have to put things in place to make sure that uh, their needs were met. So from, as far as our district, we started off um, with a hybrid model, um, a five day a week hybrid model. Um, so where, where half of the students would come in on one day, we called it A day, and the other half of students would come in on B day. And then of course, uh, as the executive order allowed, a percentage of our students have opted out, have opted to be fully remote virtual. Uh, we started out with approximately 25% of those students being fully remote virtual, and we went back and forth on how we were going to meet the needs of those students. Uh, initially, we didn't think that we were going to get that high of a percentage, but when we received approximately 25% of students that said they wanted to be fully virtual, we said, you know, there's no other way for us to um, provide equity of services than to teach them at the same time. And that would also prove difficult for the teachers to teach those students at a separate time than in the classroom. So we opted to um, live stream all of our lessons directly to those students. Um, so we started out, we started out uh, right around Labor Day and uh, we used the data, our own data, as well as um, some, dish, some data throughout the county and throughout the state, uh, which took us to about October 19th, where we transitioned to our, uh, what we call our phase two, three. Um, and the reason why we call it our phase two, three is because we kind of jumped ahead one step um, into our phase three program, uh, or excuse me, our phase three plan, which allows for our students to be five days a week in person. Uh, we also use the data between Labor Day and October 19th to really try to uh, see how things were going um, in the school. And not only did we mitigate the virus uh, at, a, at a rate that was, could never be predicted, but we also did a very, very good job. And this was happening um, since June in mitigating the fear of the virus. Um, and the way you do that is um, constant transparency, communication, and preparation. And um, I can't you know, um, thank my team enough um, from my director of buildings and grounds, my assistant principal, my business administrator, my board of education, um, my school nurse and medical team, and of course my teachers for being able to help me and assist me um, as a district leader to mitigate the fear of the virus and use science, logic, data, and reason to be able to um, design a path forward that um, takes into consideration the health and safety first, but also equally as important, takes in consideration the educational needs of our most vulnerable students, which at this time I categorize as every single student. I know some have been saying our special needs students are vulnerable 
and maybe some of your ELL population students are vulnerable. But I say um, every single student at this point in our career in education uh, is considered a vulnerable student and we need to meet their needs. So uh, you have the five days a week. How long is the school day? Uh, how is it structured, the lunch? So um, when we transitioned from phase one to phase two, um, we, we looked at all of those aspects. We said, okay, what, what plan during phase two would truly be sustainable? And how can we offer our students with the best possible education while maintaining five days a week? Um, and that was to transition to a full day schedule uh, where approximately 95% is in person. And then the students would leave at lunchtime, go home, and one class would be in the afternoon. So most, you know, the, the, the day is from uh, 8 o'clock, approximately 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. There's a lunch break, but that lunch break is outside of the building. And then students log on until approximately 2.15 p.m. And then we also, every single day, uh, offer extra help and office hours. Uh, our teachers offer that to our students every single day for the learning loss that's been happening, um, really, we, we say since March, but definitely for, uh, for this year. So, uh, well, first of all, how many, 25% opted out, is that number still about the same? Now that number has uh, creeped up a little bit since, uh, since uh, the beginning of the year. Um, one of the reasons that we feel that it's, cre that's, it's creeped up is because of the holidays. Um, so initially we said, um, what we still have this rule, if you opt out, you, there's only specific times when you could opt back, opt back in. Um, and we've kind of been using the start of our marking periods. Initially, we used, uh, you know, just uh, maybe every, every month and a half or so. And now moving forward, we're going to use the start and end of our marking periods. Um, because that, the amount of students that opt in, um, or opt out, I should say, help us in creating the most sustainable plan to keep with the social distancing in the classrooms and other areas of the building. And, and that's, in, that's important because when you do have uh, somebody that uh, gets the virus, if they are not a, a within 10, you know, within six feet of the individual for, for more than 10 minutes or so, then uh, they're not considered a close contact and you don't have to necessarily shut down the entire school or the entire classroom. So those little tweaks have, been, have helped us along the way. Um, and uh, I anticipate now that we're going into mark in period three, which starts January 25th, I anticipate that number going uh, back down to about 25% with a lot more students coming back, students that either went away during the holidays and have chosen to opt out, or students that um, may have um, uh, may needed the time since September to say, okay, uh, Becton has been open for five months, almost six months now, and uh, things have been going pretty well. Now I'm comfortable enough to come back. So um, the classroom, I guess you have social distancing policies in place. Mm -hmm. um, do you, um, the teacher, I just want to make sure I'm hearing this right. The teacher will be, the class lessons being live streamed for those who are um, remote. Yeah, so uh, every single teacher in the school building um, has li is live streams to their students at home. Um, it happens at the same exact time. So students at home have rules, procedures, and regulations to keep the equity of services that are in the classroom. They're also held to a, just the, the same standard. They have to have their camera on. They have to be uh, dressed and ready, sitting at a desk or a table, ready to learn. If they turn their camera off, they're considered absent. Um, and those students have to complete the same amount of work that teachers complete in their classroom. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, um, you know, some of the Every single staff member here has been the star of the show. Uh, but as we all know, teachers have completely reinvented their craft. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, the way that they taught forever for well over 100 years has, has been completely upended and reinvented. And I always tell them they may, they're making magic happen. And, uh, um, you know, I did that. Uh, we, we did that as a team right before the holiday break. We usually announce the teacher of the year and educator of the year. And there was just no other way to do it this year. So uh, you can check it out on our, uh, our website and our social media pages. This year, we opted to name every single staff member and every single teacher was, for the first time in our history, official board resolution was named either a teacher, employee, or educator of the year from the lunch workers 
to the bus drivers, to every single staff member, everybody uh, we feel contributed or has been contributing to the success that we've had, um, as you said, compared to other school districts, we've had tremendous success. Not only are we five days a week, but we have yet to close our doors one time due to a COVID related reason. Yeah, that's gonna be like, have you had staff members or students who have, have tested positive? I mean, I'm sure you've had a couple. Yeah, absolutely. How did you handle that? We've had approximately three a month since September, which, you know, if you if you compare that to the, you know, the, the hundreds of people that walk our hallways every single day from teachers to staff members to uh, visitors, we've limited, but you're, you're looking at about 80 days of school, 40,000 uh, people, you know, that have, you know, walk the hallway in some way, shape, or form, and to have uh, to have that uh, few cases is is pretty amazing. Um, I think if you look back on it, it's it's all in the preparation. We were ordering autonomous robotic uh, temperature screeners back in May, and everybody said we were crazy, right? We were ordering PPE uh, back in June um, and making sure that we got the stock um, so that so that we were ready to open in September. Uh, we were, we had the stickers, we had our plans ready. And by, I would say August 1st, we were ready to go. So any question that came our way, whether it was from a parent, a teacher, a student, we were able to answer it with clarity and confidence that we are ready. We have everything in place. I mean, you're talking about air filters, PPE, gloves, masks, sanitizing equipment. And we even went as far with hiring a, um, a uh, registered nurse to serve as a consultant with our current school nurse. And both of them, and this is one of the key uh, factors when talking to other school districts, both of them uh, took the time this, uh, this summer to be certified contact tracers. So we don't have to wait and go outside of the school and, and work um, you know, around the clock with other health departments to um, contact our students or staff members that may have been closed contacts. We have certified contact tracers right here in the building and our medical team is second to none. And that has, if you're, if you're talking to other districts saying, how did you do it? That's one of the major components of it. In addition, uh, we ordered atomizers, um, you know, about five, six, seven of them uh, leveraged the CRF funds, the COVID relief funds, the CARES Act funds and digital divide funds to make sure, uh, excuse me, grants that we received to make sure that we had the equipment that we need and every single one of our maintenance uh, staff members is ready to go. They come in early and the, the building every single night is deeply sanitized in a way that I've never seen before. So I have to also give kudos uh, to them for, for, um, for sanitizing the building um, every single night and getting us ready for the next day. So what was the, I mean, you went through a lot of op obstacles, a lot of preparation to do this. What was the biggest obstacle? Is it to just the continuous communication to make sure the get people's fears down? Yeah, um, uh, Ray, I, I would say that mitigating the fear of the virus is one of the largest, what was, has been one of the biggest obstacles that we face um, from the beginning. Um, but um, also making sure that people, making sure that the communication that you're putting out there is honest, it's transparent, and it's on time. And so long as you're doing that, you know, you may, you may hear some rumbles and rumors here and there, um, but there's, you know, and that's with anything really, uh, so long as you're being fair and honest and communicating and transparent, you not, you don't have anything to hide. And, uh, you know, we did that from the beginning and, you know, our culture here is one that um, is extremely positive. Uh, we've always looked at making the positive so loud that the negatives become impossible to hear, but we also have went through extreme adversity and obstacles ourselves. And um, you may or may not know, but back in March, when this virus hit, um, two weeks after the virus, we lost one of our near and dear staff members. One of the first districts in the state of New Jersey, at, uh, it was early May, where one of our case managers passed away from COVID. So we dealt with that as a staff and as a community, and we could have crumbled in, uh, under that, but instead it brought our staff and school community um, closer than ever before and strengthen our resolve to a point that I, I as a leader, have never seen before. And, and it enabled us, it gave us this, um, what I call a competitive advantage when dealing with adversity and dealing with obstacles that um, seems like at this point, you know, like you said, we're January 12th now, 
anything that comes our way, and I'll knock on wood, uh, we seem to be able to handle with a sense of calmness, a sense of resolve, and an and, and ability to think it through before acting impulsively. Um, what, has the, what has the reaction been from your uh, parents, your students, uh, the staff? You kind of alluded the staff has really bought into all this, but what has, I mean, because I've been hearing now a lot of parents want their kids in school. Uh, they feel it's better for the kids. And I think a lot of teachers and educators feel it's a better system for, but they've been having difficulty doing it. So, but, but what's the reaction been from from everyone? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been uh, outstanding. It's been, they, they it's almost been as if the Becton has been lucky or there's something watching over uh, our school district. And, you know, I'm not somebody that believes in luck too much. I believe in hard work. And, and then, you know, eventually, um, things seem to be working out and they usually work out for the individuals that put in the time and put in the work to be prepared. And our parents, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of comments, whether it's through email or verbal or phone call uh, from our parents, uh, thanking us for keeping our doors open, um, the mental health of our students, uh, they've expressed to us and we've seen it here live is also equal, is equally important as their educational health and they see their friends and their family members in other school districts struggling with their children being home, shutting off the laptop, sleeping, just disengaged, not motivated. And, you know, it correlates to, to uh, the way they learn. And uh, we're not just talking about a month or two here anymore. We're talking about in a couple, in, in a couple months, we're talking about going on a year. And um, I am of the belief if, if, uh, you know, as I said, we are an extremely transparent school community here. So I can't tell you that I'm going to close my school if there has been zero school-based transmission of the virus. If there's no epidemiologically linked case in the schools, then there's really no reason for me, along with my uh, local officials, to shut down the school. And Ray, that includes with transmission rates in the community at an all-time high. And the Department of Health's regional risk matrix, uh, which has Bergen County in our region in the orange, which is one before, you know, uh, uh, um, color code right before red. Um, and we've been saying that since the beginning. We put out a second report throughout the county um, uh, on October 19th for phase two. And shortly after that, about a month after that, uh, Dr. Fauci, which we all know, he needs no introduction, the CDC director, and the governors of the northeastern states say they said they came out and said honestly there's just no link between community rise and school-based transmission which is great if you're trying to look for a link then you know you're you're kind of fooling everybody but if if there's no link then open up the schools and we are just one microcosm one small school community that has proven that um, that school-based transmission is not linked to community-based transmission. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. And what you're seeing, and it may be hard to find, but I know it because um, I'm linked to more school districts, is we're seeing the school communities that have been closed with an uptick or an extreme, exponentially more positive student and student cases, student and staff cases, than the school districts that are open. And we've been talking about that as a team here at Becton. Uh, what, do we, what do you think it is? Why do they have more cases? They're home, they should be home. And the answer from my medical team is no. We here have structure. They come in at 8 a.m., they check their temperature, they sanitize their hands, they wear a mask, and all the healthy health and safety measures are in place for a majority of the day. By the time they're done with school, maybe they're a little tired, they go home and they're not running around with no mask and fooling around and doing things that they should. In addition to that, the students and the parents and the community members have been invaluable partners in this whole uh, reopening and sustaining our reopening. And they make sure that they stay home if there is, um, uh, if they have, you know, um, uh, an indication that they may have the virus or maybe they're exhibiting certain symptoms or they make sure that they call us and they work with us and we kind of walk them through the quarantine or isolation process so that partnership has been extremely important and they know that they need to stay connected with us to sustain this opening. Um, and you know, if it's not for anything, it's also for the students that have lost so much 
because we've also been running every single sport and club here since September. And as I may plug and throw in there, won the state championship for our football team this year. So um, it's been a pretty amazing run. And Ray, you could think about what I just said. If we closed down schools and acted impulsively and didn't use data, science, logic, and reason, our student athletes who during their hundredth season where their coach lost their brother in the middle of the season would have never got the opportunity to win a state championship and go undefeated, by the way, um, and, and just make a memory of a, of a lifetime. Just one example of many, and we're looking forward to the winter season, which is gonna be pose different challenges and to the spring musical and to other memories that students need right now more than ever. Well, uh, Dr. Swartz, I, I really wanna thank you for joining us because I know I've heard from a lot of board members, how our district's doing the in-person training. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this uh, edition. I think, hope you found it interesting to see how one district is uh, doing five days in person uh, education. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.